Okay, buckle up for the chapter 8 lecture on securing the Republic. So really this is going to take us from the formation of political parties right through the death of the Federalist Party. Uh, ironically enough, one of the first political parties to form right through its death with much uh, going on in between. So how did the first political parties really even form? Well, first, you have Hamilton's financial plan. There were three main parts to the financial plan, the first of which was establishing a national debt. Now, this was really controversial. Um, some states had been uh, really responsible about paying off their debts from the revolution. Others had not. And by establishing a national debt that would be a combination of all of the individual state debts um, was seen as unfair by those states that had responsibly paid their debts. Um, second, and probably the single most uh, controversial thing, is the establishment of a national bank to deposit the tax revenues that the nation was bringing in, but also to give loans to new businesses to grow the economy. Where would many of these tax revenues be coming from? Well, primarily would be tariffs on foreign goods. Uh, this would make prices on these foreign goods higher, uh, and therefore American industries and American goods uh, would be more attractive to the consumer. But also, excise taxes on domestic goods. And we'll come back to this uh, because one of the earliest uh, excise taxes actually led to a rebellion. So you can see here, um, this is mo mostly for your uh, reference that I included this uh, so that it would show up in your notes, but uh, this is a good way of showing um, Hamilton's financial plan and one of the things that was so controversial about that which was uh, all of the debt um, so here is domestic debt meaning what uh, essentially the Continental Army had borrowed during uh, the revolution you have foreign debt so what do we owe to foreigners um, and then you have state debts and that was the controversial piece. Uh, what about the states that had responsibly paid off their debts? Would they then have to help pay off the debts of other states? So your first two political parties that really start because of Hamilton's financial plan and most significantly the National Bank. Um, the Federalist Party, which is led by Hamilton, claims that the Constitution allowed for policies like Hamilton's financial plan through two clauses, the General Welfare Clause and the Necessary and Proper Clause, which gets the Nick's name, nickname the Elastic Clause. These are both found in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. This, historically, is referred to as loose construction. This is a pretty important term that I would uh, pay close attention to uh, and memorize. Uh, to loose construct the Constitution means that you can find ways to get things done if you read between the lines. Um, Federalists supported uh, Hamilton's plan because they thought that it would provide strength and stability to the federal government and stability if you study economics, um, if people are uh, feeling like things are stable, it will lead to economic growth. Secondly, a national bank would provide loans to new business. This would also spark economic growth. And tariffs would promote U.S. businesses against their European competitors, again, spurring economic growth. So you can kind of see here what the priority of the Federalist Party is, and that is economic growth.
Thomas Jefferson forms the Democratic Republican Party exclusively to resist Hamilton's financial plan. And um, they believed, the followers of Jefferson, uh, members of the Democratic Republican Party, believed that the plan was unconstitutional, that the general welfare and elastic clauses were not meant for this purpose. This is known as strict construction. Only what is explicitly written in the Constitution is permitted to become law. This is very different, uh, the polar opposite, in fact, of loose construction, where if you read between the lines, you can get things done. They argued against the plan because of the assumption of all state debts uh, would only benefit states who had accumulated mass amounts of debt and had not been responsible about paying those, debt off, those debts off. And a national bank would only benefit wealthy northerners, not southern farmers. So the Democratic Republicans are much more popular in the South, uh, naturally. Thomas Jefferson is from the South. He's from Virginia, whereas the Federalists were much more popular in uh, the North, which uh, Alexander Hamilton happened to be from New York. Here, again, mainly for your reference, is a chart outlining uh, the two political parties and what they uh, stood for. And then, just a joke uh, on my part, um, Alexander Hamilton on the right referring to Thomas Jefferson as some dumb hick, and then uh, Thomas Jefferson referring to Alexander Hamilton as a spoiled rich boy. I mentioned not too long ago when we were going over the financial plan and how revenues would be raised by the government, and um, I mentioned a rebellion out of one of the first excise taxes. Well, this is it, the Whiskey Rebellion. The Whiskey Rebellion was the very first excise tax that was placed directly on the citizens of the United States. Now, at this time, an excise tax, especially in the American Republic, was only being charged against what would be considered a luxury item. So this is very different than, say, taxes on sugar or tea that um, had been so controversial in the colonial period, leading or, or one of the reasons that led to the uh, American Revolution. This is slightly different. Uh, the government had an attitude of we cannot charge taxes against things that people are dependent upon. Obviously, whiskey is not a necessity. So this is one of the first taxes that they come up with to generate revenue to pay for things such as maintaining a standing army to uh, protect national security. So anyway, George Washington exercises his new powers as President of the United States and Commander-in-Chief as a result of that office uh, via the brand new Constitution to put this rebellion down. You can see in this painting that he is raising troops at Fort Cumberland for what is more or less an invasion of western Pennsylvania. So he sends these federal troops and puts down the rebellion. Now, what is most well known about this is the complete, overly severe response. Um, Washington uses far more troops than are needed, and that is because he wants to prevent future rebellions. He wants to have a show of force. And as I referenced here, you can see him depicted in the painting raising troops. Now, he's got what appears to be a rather large standing army here that is going to be used to go into western Pennsylvania and tell farmers, hey, you can't resist these taxes. I don't think you're going to need that many troops to uh, put down a rebellion of farmers. But hey, uh, Washington wanted to show uh, you don't mess with the federal government, not under the new constitution, and he did this excessive uh, use of force to prevent future rebellions. So we already discussed in class the um, farewell address that George Washington gives when he leaves office. Uh, 
One of the warnings is neutrality in foreign policy. We will return to this concept repeatedly during the course. Um, so that's not something I feel um, a need to go into a lot of depth on outside of the uh, discussion that we had in class. Um, secondly, one of his other suggestions is to avoid political parties, which we're already talking a lot about in this lecture, um, that developed anyway, despite his advice against it. Now, um, after Washington decides not to seek a third term in office, and he leaves office, his vice president, John Adams, is elected the next president of the United States. And um, he, from day one, has a very divided nation. Um, the, the National Bank plan is still very much controversial. And he faces other challenges right from the beginning of his presidency as well, such as the XYZ affair, where French diplomats had attempted to bribe U.S. government officials over the seizing of cargo on trading vessels. Um, as a matter of fact, there's a brief war called the Quasi-War fought between the U.S. and French in the Caribbean Sea. Luckily, uh, Napoleon came to f power in France shortly after this, and a peace settlement was reached because Napoleon just didn't see uh, fighting with the United States as a high priority because he was busy trying to conquer all of Europe. Um, but in this window of time where the XYZ affair was taking place, um, you had a very famous quote, and it's a prevailing attitude in the United States, and this quote, millions for defense, but not one penny for tribute. This is a Federalist congressman by the name of Robert Goodloe Harper, and this is prevailing opinion among the American people as well, in which they would much rather spend millions on a war and fighting a war than they would to, say, to pay even a single penny in bribes to the French. So these are some challenges uh, right from the get-go uh, that John Adams had to face. Also, during uh, Adams' presidency, the Federalists looked to consolidate power, and they passed two laws to their benefit, the Alien Act and the Sedition Act. Now, the Alien Act said that the president can label a foreigner a danger to the public safety and deport them. The Sedition Act said that even United States citizens, if they were to write something scandalous and malicious in a newspaper, could be fined or maybe even thrown in jail. This should sound very familiar to the John Peter Zenger case of 1733, in which he was accused of writing seditious libel against the colonial governor of New York at the time. And um, so this is all very reminiscent to people of why they demanded a Bill of Rights to the Constitution, why the very first thing that they discuss and add to the Bill of Rights is your First Amendment rights to free speech, free press, free expression. Um, naturally, these are very controversial acts of Congress, and the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions are passed claiming the right to nullify, which is a good vocab term to start to get familiar with, which just means to disregard a federal statute at the state level, and declare these acts as unconstitutional or a violation of the Bill of Rights. So the result here is that John Adams and the Federalists um, support the law, whereas the Democratic Republicans um, are in opposition, and so the Democratic Republicans gain a lot of favor among the American people because of the amount of distrust with the Federalists having passed these laws, and they sweep into power in the next election cycle and hold the presidency for the next quarter century. This is often referred to as the Revolution of 1800. It was not violent. Um, it was just a revolution in that there was drastic change to the members of the government who was representing the people. So the Federalists are seen as abusing their power. Democratic Republicans absolutely dominate the 1800 elections. As a matter of fact, the top two vote-getters in 
the election of 1800 and the presidential race are both Democratic Republicans. You had Thomas Jefferson and the man who would become his vice president, Aaron Burr. And um, these are both Democratic Republicans. This means that the Federalists are actually coming in third place in the Electoral College. Um, a House of Representatives vote uh, breaks this tie in the Electoral College and appoints Jefferson as the next president. Um, they actually, shortly after that, too, uh, wrote the Twelfth Amendment to the Constitution, which clarified how electors would cast their votes in the Electoral College system to prevent future ties. Um, even today, there is the possibility of a tie vote in the Electoral College, but it is very, very unlikely, given how they drafted the Twelfth Amendment. So... Um, anyway, you have this revolution. You can see here a advertisement, um, a broadside in which um, the Democratic Republicans are looking to turn out their voters and throw the Federalists out of office. You also can see here the uh, map that shows the uh, support for the Federalists in the Northeast in eastern Pennsylvania and New Jersey and in the eastern parts of North Carolina. So really only urban settings are supporting the Federalists. You have the Northeast which is predominantly uh, merchants trading in major cities. You have uh, Philadelphia and eastern Pennsylvania, uh, numerous cities in New Jersey, um, and then, of course, uh, coastal cities in uh, eastern North Carolina. So these are pockets of support for the Federalists, but you can see where an overwhelming majority of the country um, is much more supportive of uh, Thomas Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans. And this is large in part due to the controversy over the Alien and Sedition Acts. Now, as we uh, continue in this story of the early republic, one of the important things to discuss is how did the judiciary come to be what it was? Um, shortly after uh, the Constitution took effect, shortly after the elections of 1788, the very first government takes office in the spring of 1789. The Constitution, if you remember going back and, and going through that, Article 3 is very vague for the most part about what the uh, judiciary is going to look like. And really, the only thing we know from the Constitution is that uh, there would be a judiciary with a Supreme Court. And the Federal Judiciary Act of 1789 really outlined the remainder of the structure of the court system. And today, if you're explaining to an elementary school kid, for example, what the powers of the federal government are, you go through the three branches and you try to summarize their powers in single words. So the legislative branch makes law. The executive branch enforces that law. And it is the uh, judiciary's role, and it is established in the famous case Marbury v. Madison in 1803, it is the judiciary's role to interpret the law, which is really what judicial review is, is interpreting the law. Is this, according to the Constitution, uh, legal or not? And that language is usually constitutional or unconstitutional. Just before leaving office, uh, the story of Marbury v. Madison, this is, John Adams appoints William Marbury to a federal court judge position. However, he loses re-election, and the next president, Thomas Jefferson, orders his Secretary of State, James Madison, to block the appointment. He wants Marbury blocked, and he wants to appoint someone else. Marbury appeals directly to the Supreme Court, saying that the Judiciary Act in 1789 required that Jefferson carry out Adams' appointment. Chief Justice John Marshall, 
who becomes very, very well known, this period of time with some famous cases is referred to historically as the Marshall Court. So he writes the majority opinion and says that the court was deciding that the 1789 law Marbury was using to argue his case was a violation of the principles of the Constitution or unconstitutional. Um, they did not nullify the entire Judiciary Act. They nullified uh, some of the laws that had been passed in 1789. So it's not that the entire Judiciary Act was getting thrown out. Uh, the court structure uh, was still going to stay in place. They just thought that the statute that had been established uh, giving uh, appointments of previous presidents uh, the ability to be appointed even after the next person takes office, they declare that unconstitutional. So this case establishes this principle of judicial review, which allows the Supreme Court to overturn any unconstitutional federal or state law. Their ability to interpret the Constitution. So um, this is really how the judiciary takes shape in this time period. So here's a silly little uh, political cartoon. Some people uh, point out in political science and the study of government um, that the judiciary more or less made up its own power by deciding this case, uh, made up the power of judicial review. And a judge is saying, I wish for the power to declare laws unconstitutional. And the genie's looking at him and saying, well, why waste a wish on something you can grant yourself? And this is just a humorous way of pointing out that the judiciary really did kind of establish its own power. Now, in 1819, another case that was decided by Chief Justice John Marshall is McCulloch v. Maryland. This is a very famous case in which the state of Maryland, long story short, was trying to tax a bank that had been chartered by the federal government, uh, the National Bank, essentially, or, or one of the state branches of the National Bank in Maryland. And the uh, state law establishing those taxes was nullified by a decision, so declared void, uh, by a decision of the Supreme Court because federal law is supreme. Federal supremacy. This is an actual clause from the Constitution that the judiciary said was being violated. Um, and here's another funny cartoon. Um, the judge is saying establishing a national bank was necessary to carry out Congress's power to tax. And the state of Maryland is saying, exactly, that's why we want it stopped. They don't want to pay taxes. Um, here's another McCulloch v. Maryland uh, cartoon. So uh, the banker is telling McCulloch, who was suing uh, over the uh, taxes being levied on banks, oh, give it up, McCulloch, it's not going to work. And then the authorities show up and say, sorry, sir, but you really can't make a state tax for a national bank. He goes back and he says, oh, well, there it is, right there in Article 1 of the Constitution. Guess I was wrong. Yes, I know, nerdy history teacher jokes, but I thought it was pretty funny. Lastly, um, you have another famous case in which the Marshall Court, again, uh, clarifies yet another clause of the Constitution, which is, federal power to regulate interstate commerce. And this is clarified in the decision Gibbons v. Ogden. Um, essentially, Ogden had been given the exclusive right to operate steamships in New York waters. And um, the response from Gibbons, another merchant with his own steamship company, says, but wait a minute, you are controlling the Hudson River. And that is not okay because part of the Hudson River services the state of New Jersey as well. That makes it an interstate waterway. <laughs> 
John Marshall and the Supreme Court agree with Gibbons. And they say that a state cannot give exclusive rights to operate on an interstate waterway like the Hudson River. So therefore, this New York state law granting this exclusive relationship to Ogden was nullified. And this is all a clarification of the federal government power to regulate interstate commerce. Um, and so this reinforces the idea that the federal government, it, its laws are supreme to the states. So not only is it clarifying interstate commerce, but it is also clarifying, yet again, federal supremacy, much in the same way that McCulloch versus Maryland had clarified uh, federal supremacy. Here is another cartoon. Hey, Susie, who's that guy over there? Oh, he's Ogden, a steamboat operator between New York and New Jersey. Wait. I thought only I had a federal license. Who gave you your license, you fraud? Uh, so, Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. Just something silly. So, during Jefferson's presidency, um, he's kind of given a conundrum. He's a strict constructionist of the Constitution. He thinks that uh, you can only do things that are exclusively written in the Constitution. Um, he however, sends negotiators to France to attempt to purchase the port of New Orleans from Napoleon's government. And he gives this delegation the authority to spend up to $10 million, again, on the port of New Orleans, and the port of New Orleans only. Now, Napoleon's regime is in the middle of the Napoleonic Wars in Europe, and conquering huge swaths of Europe. They're in very deep debt from the wars, and they still see even more fighting ahead and could really use the money to help fund the war. So French negotiators absolutely shock the U.S. delegation when they offer the entire Louisiana Territory for $15 million. So half again as much of what Jefferson had authorized them to spend, but to get all of the Louisiana Territory, not just the Port of New Orleans. They immediately take the deal without even speaking to Jefferson. Uh, remember, this is a time of very slow communication, so they're in France. It would take too long to send word back, get permission from Jefferson. So they take the deal. They, they take the deal, and Jefferson is initially very furious, but then he realizes what a good deal it is, and he advises Congress to approve the purchase of Louisiana. Now... This is a little bit at odds with his belief in strict construction because nowhere does it really say he or that delegation had the authority to do what they did. But nonetheless, uh, Congress agrees that this is a very good deal because it effectively doubled the size of the United States. Um, here in uh, light tan brown, you can see the United States at the time. And then you can also see the doubling by adding the Louisiana Purchase when, in the beginning, all they had wanted was the Port of New Orleans. You can also see on this map, and we're about to make reference to, the Lewis and Clark expedition that began in St. Louis and researched the entire region all the way out, even beyond what was U.S. borders, to the Pacific Northwest and the coast of the Pacific Ocean. Um, very famous stories come from this, uh, the journals of Lewis and Clark themselves. Um, but this expedition is really uh, a question of what would this new territory have to offer the nation? Uh, so they go on this expedition and their goals are to see what natural resources can be exploited for profit. Um, to establish trade relations with Western Native American tribes, and this is dating all the way back to the Columbus expeditions in Central America, they are still trying to find a direct water route to the Pacific Ocean. Um, it is never found, uh, but that is part of their goals. Now, after staying in the Dakotas during the winter of 1804-1805, uh, they're accompanied the rest of the way to the Pacific by a 15-year-old Shoshone Indian woman by the name of Sacagawea. Uh, 
and uh, you often hear her name pronounced Sacagawea. Um, that's actually really bad pronunciation. Uh, her name was actually Sacagawea, and she served as the guide and interpreter for Lewis and Clark. Without her, as a matter of fact, they probably would have perished. Uh, they return in 1806, Lewis and Clark, with a wealth of information recorded in journals, along with a lot of specimen samples of uh, uh, vegetation, uh, animals that they had encountered on their journey. And you can see this very famous painting of Lewis and Clark, um, and this really depicts them in the Rocky Mountains. And here is Sacagawea leading the way. Um, the United States, during the presidency of Thomas Jefferson, had to deal with Barbary pirates on the Mediterranean Sea. And this is a uh, very famous thing, whether you've heard of it or not. And it's famous because it is included in the lyrics to the Marine Corps hymn which the lyric is to the shores of Tripoli. And that all uh, ties into the story of the Barbary pirates and our fighting of the Barbary wars with them. So Mediterranean pirates are uh, capturing and holding more than 100 American sailors as slaves. And this paralyzes American trade in the Mediterranean. Uh, the U.S. had been paying large ransoms. We even agreed to regular annual payments to these pirates. Um, it's kind of crazy that this was even allowed to happen, especially given the outrage people felt towards the XYZ affair. So after Adams leaves office, uh, Jefferson says, no, enough of this. He refuses stronger demands from the Turkish governor of Tripoli, and the Turkish governor turns around and declares war on the United States. Um, the Barbary Wars was a series of naval conflicts over the course of about three years, between 1801 and 1804, and um, it ends when an American squadron won a huge victory at Tripoli Harbor in what is modern-day Libya. Um, long story short, um, the international law that pretty much everybody recognizes, this is, goes back many generations, is that international waters, large bodies of water, so the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, uh, and then between uh, Europe and Africa lies the Mediterranean Sea. It is so large that it is seen as uh, usable by anyone. Uh, it is really referred to as freedom of the seas. Um, this is actually, we will come back to this when we cover things like U.S. entry into uh, World War I, but uh, that was one of the reasons we entered World War I, is the freedom of the seas, uh, Germans attacking uh, via their U-boats, uh, which are submarines, uh, U.S. trading vessels, and it dragged us into World War I. We will go over that in a lot more detail when we get there, but um, it is this concept of freedom of the seas that is being violated by this Turkish governor of Tripoli and therefore uh, leading to these Barbary Wars. And uh, the Marines are a large part in uh, securing this victory at Tripoli, and therefore it is part of their uh, Marine Corps hymn even today. Now, uh, the issue of stolen cargo, impressment of sailors, this does not end after the XYZ affair or the Barbary Wars. Um, Thomas Jefferson is sick of dealing with these issues, so he convinces Congress to pass the Embargo Act in December of 1807. This forbids all commerce with all of Europe. That's a big decision. Um, Jefferson had always been a proponent of a limited government, which was very stark in contrast to his exercising of federal authority in this particular circumstance. So again, this is something that Jefferson says one thing, 
He doesn't like government authority and use of power, and yet he uses his power as president to influence Congress to pass this Embargo Act. Well, it's a giant dumpster fire. U.S. exports plummet by over 80% the following year. The economy is teetering on the brink of absolute disaster, while nations like Britain and France don't really see any effects. They can get what they need from other countries that they had formerly gotten from the United States. And in 1809, the embargo was lifted on all nations except Britain and France via the Non-Intercourse Act. And even those nations could reestablish trade with the U.S. if they vowed to cease stealing U.S. cargo and impressing U.S. soldiers. Now, uh, let's do a quick definition before moving on of impressment. Uh, this is really just forcing sailors who are Americans to then serve in, say, the British or the French Navy. Um, and this becomes an even bigger issue, and why I'm clarifying that definition, in the War of 1812. So, why did the War of 1812 even happen? Well, first of all, you have impressment being an issue that is still persisting. Even after Jefferson leaves office, uh, Adams had dealt with it, Jefferson had dealt with it. It's coming to a head. Next, you have settlers in the West complaining of Native American attacks, mostly by a leader by the name of Tecumseh and his followers. And the major complaint is that the British were the ones supplying Tecumseh. And then lastly, you have war hawks in Congress who believe, you know what? If we fight a war with Britain, we might be able to expand the United States even more by acquiring British Canada. And eventually, the war is officially declared in 1812. Um, at uh, the time, it's it's not all that easy to uh, fight quick battles, and so wars dragged on a lot longer than you would envision today. Uh, look at the American Revolution, as a matter of fact. Uh, that dragged on for uh, about eight years before there was finally a resolution. The War of 1812 was fought over the course of a few years. Um, the peace settlement at the end of the war is essentially a draw. Neither side really gains any money or territory or anything like that. There's mixed reactions to this within the United States. Some people thought we should have gotten something out of it. Um, and despite the fact that there is some controversy, it leads to significant nationalism in which Americans are taking pride in having fought Britain off yet again, a second time, and fighting them to a draw. Um, Andrew Jackson becomes a national hero at the Battle of New Orleans and is eventually elected President of the United States uh, from that fame. Francis uh, Scott Key writes The Star-Spangled Banner, and it is adopted as the national anthem of the United States after the fact. Um, other Americans, though, are not all that excited about the fighting of the war. Um, Federalists, and this is really what... Uh, kind of puts the nail in the coffin of the Federalist Party, start protesting the war and even threaten to secede from the Union during the war. Um, and in the winter of 1814-15, the Hartford Convention is held where Federalists nearly did decide to secede from the Union over the War of 1812. So, as I said, this is the nail in the coffin of the Federalist Party. They were already deeply unpopular due to the Alien and Sedition Acts. They are even further shamed by the Hartford Convention. Um, the Democratic-Republicans, after Madison is ready to leave office, um, they nominate his Secretary of State, James Monroe, who absolutely dominates the election of 1816. Um, the eight years following... Uh, our Monroe's presidency, he gets re-elected again four years later, um, this is known as the era of good feelings, which really just means uh, everybody's kind of on the same page, believe it or not. For as controversial as much of American history is politically, um, people are very much on the same page in this window of about eight years. Um, the Federalist Party is replaced by the Democratic Party, 
which elects its first president in 1828 in Andrew Jackson. Um, and actually, he uh, ran four years prior to that in 1824, and there was a lot of controversy in that election. So um, this era of good feelings does not last all that long. Uh, eight years sounds like a long time, but uh, it really isn't. Um, Federalists are predominantly anti-slavery, so the death of this party meant that any hope of anti-slavery laws getting passed dies with it. Uh, the Democratic Party, uh, its greatest spokesman, Andrew Jackson, um, is very pro-slavery. As a matter of fact, it becomes the party of slavery from this point until the outbreak of the Civil War uh, in 1860-61 after the election of Abraham Lincoln. Um, so this is a window of time in which there was really only one functional political party, and that was the Democratic Republicans. Others existed, but the Democratic Republicans absolutely dominated politics. And um, it isn't until the Democratic Party and Andrew Jackson uh, establish a competitive second party that anything changes from that. So as I said at the beginning of the lecture, we would go from the formation of the first political parties right through the death of the Federalist Party. That's the end of the lecture. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out, and I will see you in class.